Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. We appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Coming up today, the coronavirus pandemic meets the obesity epidemic. How the global health crisis is changing our health behaviors talking about going beyond masks and social distancing and right into our refrigerator and exercise habits. Dr. Hanna Kaliova will be with us to discuss brand new research on how the pandemic is affecting all of us. Also today, Dr. Jazz, Dr. Jasmine Sardana will be helping to get us on that healthier track and avoid putting on those pounds during the lockdown, the COVID-19, quote unquote, tips for staying healthy and curbing junk food cravings during the lockdown. Plus, she's going to be answering your questions when we open up the doctor's mailbag. So if there's something on your mind that you would like to ask Dr. Jazz, go ahead and post that in the comments or the chat right now. You can also tweet that to us using the hashtag exam room live. Just send that on over to at Chuck Carroll, WLC or at PCRM. Some great questions already coming in. Plus today, we're going to need your help to save our four-legged friends in Michigan. Big happenings there. Trying to get dog experiments ended in all publicly funded institutions. Going to be speaking with our own Christy Sullivan on that. She just testified this morning, as a matter of fact, on this. So we will be speaking with her in just a little bit. And we're going to be heading over to the exam room news desk, getting a check on health headlines. But we begin today with the global pandemic and how it is affecting all of us, even those who have not become infected. Talking about taking potato chips and pizza and turning them into over-the-counter medicine, comfort foods and stress, no doubt worsening the effects of the pandemic, again, among those who aren't even affected. Global study now looking at the size of this program, uh, the problem rather, and it is expanding very, very rapidly. To talk about this new study, let's go ahead and bring in Dr. Hanna Kaliova. Dr. Kaliova, thanks for taking the time today. Thanks for having me, Chuck. Uh, you know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic doesn't have to be a negative experience for our health behaviors, right? It's, it's in our power. However, uh, it's important to see what the data say. Uh, and uh, to answer that, I'd like to share my slides and let's see what the new study found. A new study that has just been published in the journal Obesity uh, has looked at the health behaviors of people and the impact of COVID-19. So they did an online survey in almost 8,000 people, uh, mostly in the United States, um, but the participants were uh, from all over the world. Uh, and about a third of them were normal weight, about a third of them were overweight, and a third of them were obese. They were tracking their eating, uh, exercise, sleep, and also mental health. And, you know, people started being less physically active and started engaging more in sedentary behavior. But what's also interesting, even people who uh, still... Uh, are keeping their physical physical activity, um, they their intensity went down. Uh, so this is something we could definitely uh, improve. Um, then what about the diet? The good thing is that people are cooking more at home, so they can use fresh ingredients. And many people really strive to make the diet healthier and use more fruits and vegetables at home. At the same time, also the consumption of snacks and, and sodas went up, which is not a positive finding. In, ter in terms of mental health, uh, the levels of anxiety went up, uh, and particularly in the obese group, uh, where the baseline anxiety levels were the highest, uh, and they went, went up even more than in the normal weight and overweight people. How many people gained weight over the, you know, since uh, the COVID-19 started? Uh, about a third of the people who filled out the survey um, gained weight. Uh, unfortunately, more of in the obese uh, category gained weight than in the normal weight category. And uh, 44 people uh, also indicated that their sleep worsened. 
uh, during the pandemic. Uh, they started going to bed later and also uh, started getting up later uh, in the day and the quality of sleep worsened. So to summarize the findings, uh, people uh, tend to exercise less and also um, with less intensity, they engage in more sedentary behaviors. Um, they're cooking more at home, which is a good thing, but they're also consuming more snacks and sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, they experience more anxiety and about a third of the people gained weight. Uh, and they also reported poor sleep. Uh, so what's, how, how can we improve um, these health behaviors? When we are at home, uh, it's, it's easy to cook some um, healthy plant-based meals. Uh, when we put our physical activity on our schedule and stick to it, we can do it. Um, we can be more cautious about our sleep habits and also take care of our mental health. Enjoy the outdoors, even though it's kind of chilly right now, but we don't have to watch the news all the time, right? We can do also read a book or do, do something um, that makes us happy uh, so that the, the anxiety levels are not as high. We're going to get more tips in just a little bit when we're joined by Dr. Jazz, Dr. Jasmine Sardana. But Dr. Kaliofa, back to the study itself. I'm curious, did the researchers get an opportunity to discover why it was that people who were already overbeast tended to put on more weight during the pandemic versus people who were not overweight? Yeah, it uh, also with the anxiety levels, right? Uh, the obese people had higher anxiety levels at baseline. It seems like whatever the people were struggling with, uh, you know, these health behaviors got even worse. So uh, if people were struggling with their body weight at, at baseline, they tended to overcompensate with food again, uh, you know, because um, COVID-19 brought another layer of stress for each one of us. And people cope with stress in different ways. Uh, some people uh, eat less, some people eat more. And more people in the obese category started eating more in response to the stress. Yeah, I remember during one of the earlier shows in the pandemic, when it began uh, coming out and becoming clear that the more excess weight that you had, the more at risk that you were. I remember asking uh, Dr. Barnard, you know, for people who are severely morbidly obese uh, in that three and 400 pound category, uh, you know, what their chances would be. And essentially, you know, at best, it's it's a coin flip for survival. And I think that when you hear news of that get broadcast, and spoken about. Of course, that's going to add a lot of anxiety. You couple that on top of the other problems that all of us are facing, you know, job uncertainty, losing jobs. Um, you know, when am I going to go back to the office? Will there be an office to go back to? When will it be safe again to resume normal life? All of these things come into play. And yeah, that does lead to uh, a lot of stress for all of us. And um, that's why, you know, it, it is important right now that as we're hunkered down still, um, hopefully in the home stretch of this thing, but we continue to be hunkered down, but we start taking steps toward uh, a healthier lifestyle uh, as we head into the new year and hopefully certainly a healthier new year as well. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also some healthy ways how to cope with the stress. For example, classical music has been shown to reduce the stress levels. So, you know, turn on some Vivaldi's Four Seasons. <laughs> you know, now's the, now's the good time. And just before Christmas, maybe more festive in terms of music. Uh, it doesn't have to be carols only, although carols can make you happy as well. Yeah. Wow. Vivaldi, huh? Vivaldi catapult <laughs> catapulting you into a healthier life. I did not know that. Four seasons for the win. Dr. Kaliova, thank you so very much. I look forward to speaking with you on Thursday's episode of the Exam Room podcast. You and I are going to talk more about your groundbreaking study on plant-based diets, the effect they have on metabolism and weight loss. Uh, we spoke about that briefly on the show here for about 10 minutes last week, but on the podcast, you and I get the opportunity to speak about it in depth for about 40 minutes. And I, I'm really looking forward to that conversation because the, the research that you and your team did is just extraordinary. 
Thank you so much, Jack. All right. And uh, make sure that you are subscribed to the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee. Head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify, wherever shows are available. Hit that subscribe button, leave a five-star rating, and get ready for Thursday because that science is coming and it's coming in the best of ways possible. All right. Before we open up the doctor's mailbag to take your questions, let's continue our conversation about health habits during the lockdown. You just heard Dr. Kaliova talk about the challenges that we're facing, a lot of us putting on that so-called COVID-19, and a lot of that has to do with stress and anxiety. Well, what can we do about that beyond just what Dr. Kaliova was talking about that? The perfect person to speak about this is lifestyle medicine expert, our very own Dr. Jazz, Dr. Jasmine Sardana. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Chuck. So happy to be here again. The COVID-19 putting on weight, stress eating, that uh, obviously, as we just heard, not an uncommon problem. Uh, when you're talking to patients who are struggling with stress and anxiety and weight gain, what are some of the tips that you give them to coach them into making healthier food decisions? Thank you so much, Chuck. You're so incredibly right. And I'm so thankful for Dr. Kaliova's, um, you know, presentation in bringing more of this to the forefront. And in fact, in clinic, the patients that I'm seeing are also struggling with these same things. So just to confirm all of that research from a clinical background, this is actually happening. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners would agree as well, unfortunately. So it's either the quarantine 15 or it is the um, COVID-19, right, that we're seeing patients put on. And unfortunately, those extra pounds are not innocuous. Having that that extra weight on can put you at higher risk of developing these chronic conditions like uh, just obesity on its own, but could potentially put you at risk of developing diabetes, um, puts you at risk of heart disease. And we know that these particular chronic conditions, it's not just about the stress that comes with it, but the chronic conditions um, that develop that could potentially cause a more severe course of the disease uh, should you uh, unfortunately get this uh, disease. So, you know, getting back to the root cause, that's what I, as a lifestyle mm -hmm. medicine physician, really, really uh, try to uh, hone in with my patients is that your micro actions, right? Every single day, those daily choices that you make compound and build uh, and can either end up you know, leaning you and pushing you towards a negative outcome, but it can actually also, there's a lot of power in that, in that it can pull you towards uh, keeping you really healthy. And there's been no better time for us to be focusing on our health. So when it comes to what's some of the advice that I give my patients when it comes to limiting, um, you know, the risk of putting on those extra pounds. So I do encourage all of my patients to adopt a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, no matter where you are along that spectrum of diet, you know, from a standard American diet all the way down to a low fat, no oil, salt, sugar, whole food, plant based diet, everyone, I encourage all of my patients to start moving towards that end because that's where the goal should be for, for the majority, the most of, of people. Um, because again, evidence continues to show us that individuals who adopt a whole food, plant based diet have the you know, most optimal BMI that's been studied and um, shown over and over again. So number one, including whole foods, plants at every single meal and following the power plate um, pattern where you're like half of your plate is vegetables, then you're using making sure that you're getting in legumes or beans um, and as well as vegetables and then using fruit um, either as dessert or as part of that meal and using that formula at every single meal, I think is an important way to be able to incorporate more whole foods and plants, which include which you know, turns into you eating more fiber, which helps to keep you satiated, which helps to keep some of that weight off. I also tell my patients, Chuck, about the importance of drinking water. Um, now, emotional eating has been something I think lots of people have been struggling with in the midst of this pandemic. It's just been stressful. There's been a lot of uncertainty. And uh, we might be finding ourselves, you might be finding yourself standing in front of that fridge, opening that door for like the 20th time or your pantry. Uh, and I guarantee most of those times that you're standing there, it's not because you're really hungry. So another tip I tell my patients to do is to separate out your hunger cues from those emotional cues. And how you do that is simply just by stopping and saying, oh wait, am I really hungry? And a good test of that, Chuck, is to drink a glass of water. Uh, oftentimes when we think that, even when we think that we're hungry, 
it might be that you're not getting enough water. So drink a glass of water, give yourself a couple minutes and then wait and see, okay, am I still really hungry or is this, you know, pushed by my emotions? And if you're really hungry, choose something healthy, great. And if you're not really hungry, try to do something else. And I know this is easier said than done. I absolutely understand this. But removing yourself from the kitchen, right? Going outside to a different you know, area of your house, um, getting a book, finding a way to distract yourself for the moment until some of that passes is uh, a good way and a good technique to kind of limit and to cut down on some of that emotional eating. Uh, it's also important to be to break some of the unusual eating patterns that maybe uh, our viewers and listeners have fallen into during the pandemic. We know, Chuck, that our you know daily structure has been kind of maybe thrown out the window. Even if you're, especially if you're working from home, your days probably your work days were probably stretching out and leading into your evening routine where it wouldn't have happened before. So if you find yourself eating later in the day, snacking, skipping breakfast, those are really important things to be aware of because you're probably going to be eating more calories um, and eating closer to your bedtime, which we know results in more weight and more calories being retained. So encouraging my patients to separate emotional uh, cues from hunger cues, um, as well as discovering or uncovering what those un, uh, un, unhealthy patterns might be for their eating is another important thing with their diet. And then next, Chuck, the other thing that I also talk to them about, yes, it's diet, but as a lifestyle medicine physician, I'm also really interested in whether or not my patients are moving. So we know this is very well known, right? Getting regular physical activity is really important to keep your weight down. How do you do that in the midst of a pandemic? when the gyms have closed down or maybe even going outdoors gives you anxiety if you were running. So that's all very true, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you can't be outdoors at all. Being outdoors in a safe way, wearing a mask, distancing yourself um, is still an important option uh, and, and can be a healthy option. Now with the weather going a little, getting a little bit cooler and it being harder for patients to be, or people to be outdoors to exercise, I ask my patients, what is something that you can do indoors? What's something that you've done before? So a couple of tips when it comes to families, or even if you have roommates, even if you're by yourself, uh, you could even do this, you know, virtually with friends or, you know, through a chat room where you have a challenge throughout the day where you're doing a push-up challenge, or you're doing a sit-up challenge, or you're doing a, one of my favorites, not my favorite thing to do, but a plank challenge because it's really effective. So one thing I do in my family is that, um, you know, we've done is that uh, over the weekends is up, it's push up time and everybody who can hear me uh, in the house will drop and do 10 push ups or however many that they can do. And it, it turns it into kind of a fun, engaging game and a way to get in some of our physical activity during the day. So it might be, you know, the next time that that happens, it might be my husband or another person who'll say, oh, push up time and everybody will drop and do five push-ups or do sit-ups or, or hold planks for like 30 seconds. And it's just a fun way to be able to incorporate more physical activity indoors um, that we've been able to do. And then when it comes to, so those, you know, when it comes to food, physical activity and managing stress, that's another all important thing. I've been seeing more and more patients who have been stressed out, who didn't realize uh, just how stressed out they were. Now, all of us are kind of sharing in this collective anxiety that COVID-19 uh, has brought, and we're not really sure uh, how well to deal with this. So this is, you know, kind of a silver lining in that a lot of people now have to confront, wait, I don't really have, you know, very great coping mechanisms when it comes to stress and have to look for something. So some important ways to manage stress is, yes, physical activity. Number one, you know, regular physical activity where you're moving your body, Evidence, again, continues to show us that getting regular physical activity is important for our mood and in managing our symptoms um, of low mood. It's essentially like getting a microdose of an antidepressant because it helps to improve the level of these neurotransmitters that uh, might be lacking. In addition, that one thing I mentioned um, that I didn't mention with getting physical activity is if you're able to get outdoors, getting that vitamin D is so crucial and critical um, when it comes to your mental health as well. And I love Dr. Kaliova's 
uh, tip about listening to classical music. I think music in, in any form, right, uh, can improve your mood, can help relax you. And additionally, something interesting that I uh, was looking into was listening to meditative, not meditation, meditation I think is a great practice, but listening to meditative frequencies. So they're called solfeggio frequencies and you can listen to different frequencies and they have a very calming effect on your body. So, you know, I'm gonna add to Dr. Kaliova's recommendation of listening to classical music and I'm gonna add on to listening to some meditative sounds and to see if that can help to calm uh, and relax some of the um, stressful emotions that might be, might be coming up. And the relationships is our next piece that has definitely taken a toll. It's been much harder to keep in touch with our families, our loved ones, to go out and to do the things that we've been so used to and maybe have taken for granted a little bit. But it is the most important, one of the most important things to be focusing on today is to maintain those relationships. Um, and in fact, one way that you can use those relationships to help create a healthier waistline and to have healthier uh, dietary outcomes is by using your team as accountability partners. So research tells us that if you create goals surrounding your uh, diet and lifestyle, you're more likely to achieve them just by, you know, saying out loud or writing out what that goal is. But additionally, if you share that goal with another person uh, who's able to offer some of that accountability, you're that much more likely to achieve that goal. So I'm gonna challenge all of our listeners uh, to our viewers there is to offer yourself as the accountability partner for a friend this week. For over the next week or two weeks, offer yourself, uh, call up one of your friends and say, hey, listen, you know, if there's anything, if there's been a health goal that you'd like to work on, I'd love to be an accountability, accountability partner for you. And I'd love if you could do the same. Is that something you'd be interested in? And I, I would guess that most of our friends and family would be delighted to be a part of something like that. And that's another way that you can use your relationships uh, in your life to help with keeping yourself healthy. Sleep is another in, just another vital piece to the puzzle here. And I can't talk about this enough because we, I recognize just how much our sleep has been disrupted in the midst of this pandemic. Um, as I mentioned before, our daily structure of our day from when we wake up to log on, if you're working from home and the meetings that you're taking and the work that you have to do on, um, on top of everything. And on top of all of that, you're responsible maybe for childcare, for cooking, for grocery uh, shopping. Um, and so your day is filled with these extra stressors. And you'll find, um, you might find that it's been affecting your sleep. Now, another piece of that is also in this pandemic, there's been reports that more people are consuming more alcohol. And yes, you know, initially with a glass of wine or two, you might feel a little bit sleepier and you might think that that's going to help with sleep, right? Well, in fact, what we know is that alcohol is a sleep disruptor. So maybe initially you might find yourself feeling a little bit drowsier and readier, you know, ready to get to bed. But when you're actually asleep, what we find is that individuals who've consumed alcohol prior to going to sleep, that they are not as likely to get into that deep restorative REM sleep. In fact, it's harder for them to get there and, and they stay there in a limited period of time. So you're not getting that restorative sleep. So one piece I will say is to limit the amount of alcohol, number one, because those are extra calories, right? That can contribute to excess weight gain. So if you find that you've been drinking more than usual or maybe having an extra glass, to really think about cutting back on that because it can help not just your waistline, it can help your sleep. And as and because all of these things are linked, it's important to note that, you know, studies continue to show us also that sleep deprivation is also related to weight gain. Let me uh, jump in here because we, we are kind of running out of time a little bit here. And I want to make sure. sure we have enough time to follow up on a couple of things. Um, one, yes. it's kind of generically stated that we need to eat more fruits and more vegetables. But I think that for somebody who is struggling with their weight, um, certainly this would have helped me back in the day. Uh, it would help to know exactly how much we should be eating of those every day. If you have that benchmark, I think it becomes easier than to hit that. Yeah. And, you know, that's that is a that's a really good point, Chuck. But I also want um, 
so everyone's going to be in a different stage, right? Like you should be absolutely looking for, you know, five to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables. I mean, I think that's a really healthy goal to be working towards, uh, to be achieving. But if it's, it can be as simple as making sure that I'm throwing in greens or uh, making sure I'm getting Brussels sprouts or a salad with lunch consistently every single week versus counting, okay, this is this serving. So if you, in your head, if you said, okay, I'm going to make sure I'm having a salad every single day for lunch, then that becomes less that you have to be thinking about it. And it becomes more of a habit. And and let's also talk about these poor habits that may be getting established now during the lockdowns. Um, what is the risk then that they carry over, not just into the new year, but beyond the pandemic? Because as you well know, I mean, unhealthy habits can be very hard to break. Oh my goodness, Chuck, thank you so much for saying that because you're so right. We're ripe to be developing some di you know difficult and, and challenging habits that you're right, can easily easily stretch into the new year, can easily stretch into two or three years from now. So you make such a great point that this is the time right now to make those changes and to limit that unhealthy behavior because it can absolutely carry over. And potentially maybe you're not going to be unhealthy today, but a year from now or two years from now, when you go into your doctor's office, um, you might end up with diabetes or prediabetes or, you know, heart disease. So really, really important to start making those changes today. All right. And while I've still got you here, let's go ahead and open up that doctor's mailbag. Take a question from Diego. Diego today says, uh, despite being on a plant-based diet, I still have issues with high levels of uric acid. Can you offer any advice? Yes. So uric acid, um, how that presents in our bodies is as gout uh, for some people. And how, why gout happens is because either you're increased your consumption of high purine foods, uh, and I'll share with you what some of those might be, plus or minus, you might have some difficulty excreting some of that excess uric acid uh, and purine. So you're either getting too much or you're not getting rid of it enough, or it might be a combination of both. Now on a whole food plant-based diet, there's less likely, it, it's less likely that you'll suffer from gout because the traditional foods that trigger gout and, and, and the traditional high purine foods are red meat, um, alcohol, organ meats, and seafood. So if anybody out there is, you know, considering a whole food plant-based diet, this is another reason why it's important to avoid uh, those products and to move towards a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, and alcohol is another one as well. Uh, beer, wine, those things can potentially trigger um, a gout attack because they're also considered high purine foods. So if someone who's whole food plant-based, what I would say is really think about, are you consuming alcohol? Um, you know, are you consuming complex carbohydrates? And what about those sugar sweetened foods and beverages? Sure, it might be vegan, but it might it may not be healthy, uh, even though it says vegan. And so making sure that you are limiting those foods or even cutting them out completely, if you're noticing that you have high uric acid levels that are triggering gout. Now, some people may have high uric acid levels, they may not present clinically, and I'm not sure exactly what, you know, we don't we don't know yet what the um, you know, potential ramifications of that level are. But clinically, if you're having symptoms, even though you're whole food plant-based, really think about cutting out the sugar-sweetened beverages, the alcohol from your diet and see how you do. All right. Dr. Jazz, with the great advice as always, thank you so very much. Absolutely. All right. If we did not get to your question today, have no fear. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. And if you would like to schedule a telemedicine visit with Dr. Jasmine Sardana at the Barnard Medical Center, you can do that right now by visiting barnardmedical.org or by picking up the phone to call 202-527-7500. You'll get a full list of states where services are available and they'll tell you about insurance and all of that good stuff. So 202-527-7500 or barnardmedical.org to make your appointment today with Dr. Jazz or any one of our wonderful plant-based doctors or dietitians to help your health get going as we head into this new year and beyond the pandemic. Let's switch gears now and talk about your help. Special heads up if you're living in Michigan. We need your help to save our four-legged friends in that state. A new bill there would end painful experiments on dogs in publicly funded institutions in Michigan. And someone who testified on this bill this very morning is our own Christy Sullivan. Christy, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Ah, there you are. Hi, Christy. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about this bill, what it would do, and how your morning went. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so I don't know if you, I, I've told you before, I'm a Michigan native. I got my training at the University of Michigan. And so it's a, a good match for me to testify in support of this bill. Um, but the bill is uh, Senate Bill 971 in the Michigan State Senate. It was introduced by Senator Michael McDonald and it would ban research and training procedures at public institutions that cause pain and distress in dogs. So it's very specifically targeting the cruelest experiments that are conducted on our best friends. And let's talk about how much public support there seems to be for this already. I understand that overwhelmingly the residents of Michigan are in favor of this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in a poll that we conducted last year, there are 70% of Michigan voters said they oppose using dogs in painful experiments. And a similarly high, a number 66% said they oppose using taxpayer Monday funding to, um, to fund the experiments. So here's kind of where I would view this as uh, not just somebody who has great compassion for animals, but just as a taxpayer as a whole, right? So my money then would be going to fund these experiments. But one of the things, Christy, that you and I have spoken about previously on the show is that these experiments don't always translate into relevant research when it comes to humans. Can you talk about that? That's right. So these experiments... Um one of the biggest research programs that this uh, law is intended to address is some dog research uh, on cardiovascular system that is going on at Wayne State University. This research that they're doing has been going on for almost three decades, since 1991. More than 300 dogs have died in these experiments. And um, essentially what they're doing is implanting a number of devices into the dogs, and then they force them to run on treadmills um, and speed their heart's heart rate up to cause heart failure. And um, we, we have looked and looked through the literature and, and analyzed the work that they have published, and we don't find any impact on actual human health from these experiments. Um, you know, cardiovascular disease remains a major problem. It's a major killer. And even in Michigan, um, it's estimated that by 2030, there might be 2.9 million Michigan residents that are going to have heart disease. Um, the university says, you know, this research is ongoing. It's making progress. Well, it's been almost 30 years and we don't really have any evidence of any progress except for some papers in the scientific literature. So uh, what we're advocating for is that the state of Michigan says um, that we don't wanna use dogs in these experiments. Uh, we want our universities, our public institutions to use methods that are more effective, uh, studying human populations, human clinical studies, um, there are now really advanced uh, technologies in the laboratory where uh, scientists can study the mechanisms of cardiovascular disease in human cells and tissues, uh, little um, hearts on a chip, they're, they're sometimes called, are being developed at many universities, uh, the vasculature on a chip where they have tiny blood vessels that they can really research and understand the mechanisms of heart disease in humans. All right. So let's see if we can just kind of sum this up. These experiments that are tormenting these dogs. I mean, there's really no other way to, to say it. I mean, flat mm -hmm. out, these dogs are being tortured here. Uh, they're needless. They're not translating into anything that would uh, help humans uh, down the line, even though that would be the intent. So if uh, it's not helping, therefore it's unnecessary, yet these dogs are still dying. And and taxpayer dollars are actually funding that. Is that this bill in a nutshell, shutting that down? Exactly. Mm. All right, so uh, let's uh, put out a call to action. If someone is watching this right now, living in the state of Michigan, how can they get involved and where do things stand right now with the bill? Okay, so uh, unfortunately it's the end of the legislative session this year. So we're going to have to reintroduce the bill next year. We were very glad to get a hearing because we were able to present our case um, to the legis to the to the relevant committee, uh, but the committee didn't vote on the bill yet. There's going to be some more um, 
if we if we are able to introduce the bill next year uh, with our legislative partners, then we'll be able to lobby all of the offices that we need to and talk to them about um, why this is a good idea. And uh, so we'll be needing people's help next year. Um, we will also actually be emailing all of our supporters in Michigan to ask them to thank the committee members for bringing this bill up for a hearing so that we could discuss it. All right. And uh, if someone is watching this right now, living outside of the state of Michigan, I would assume that anything that they can donate to the Physicians Committee so that we can continue our work and lobbying for the passage of this bill, that would go a long way. That would be so much appreciated. <laughs> Absolutely. And right now, if you head over to pcrm.org slash donate, I do believe that there is a dollar for dollar match through the end of the year. So there's never been a better time to give what you can. It will go so far, twice as far as, as you would ordinarily think. So pcrm.org slash donate, your dollars will be matched dollar for dollar. Christy Sullivan, thank you so very much. Thank you for having me on. All right. It is our absolute pleasure. I also want to thank Drs. Hanna Kaliova and Jasmine Sardana for joining us today. And big thank you to the crew behind the scenes, as always, that makes this show possible. And to you, my exam roomies, thanks for spending your day with us and raising your nutrition and health IQs with us as well. On behalf of everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so very much for tuning in. Until tomorrow, when we'll be joined by Dr. Will Bolsowitz talking all things gut health. Until then, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.